Hello everyone, so this is the walkthrough for GCSE Combined Science Trilogy Physics Paper 1 and this is the Foundation Physics Paper that pupils sat in May 2018. So I'm going to walk through this uh, paper and explain how I would have tackled it. Now in the description there is the link to this past paper and also the mark scheme and along with a collection of revision videos that relate to the specific questions in this past paper. So if you do struggle with one, you can go back and revise the content for it. So question number one, there are many types of different energy resources, which two energy resources are renewable. So we should know that renewable means it will not run out. So if we go through the list, We've got biofuel, coal, gas, geothermal and nuclear, and we've got to make sure we tick two of them. So we should know that coal, gas and nuclear, their fuels will eventually run out, so they are non-renewable. So therefore biofuel, which is plant organic matter, and geothermal, which is energy from the Earth's core, are renewable, they will not run out. Question 1.2. Some non-renewable energy resources are often more reliable than others. Which statement correctly describes a reliable resource? Now, if something is reliable, it means we know we will have a constant supply. So, for example, things like wind and solar can be not reliable because we don't necessarily have an awful lot of sun or a constant supply of wind to generate that electricity. So we got, we've got to tick one box, let's see what the sentences say. So does reliability, meaning it does not burn a fuel? No, it is predictable. So initially I would be thinking that, but let's check the other two. It will never run out. Well, no, that's the definition of renewable. It is cheap to use. It's got nothing to do with that. So therefore, it would be our second one. Question 1.3. Figure 1 shows a wind farm. The total output of the wind farm is 19.6 megawatts. All the wind turbines produce the same amount of power. What is the power output of one wind turbine? So we know the total is 19.6 and we can see from the diagram this wind farm consists of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven wind turbines. So therefore to calculate it we can do 19.6 divided by 7 which equals 2.8 megawatts. Only a one mark question so don't overcomplicate it. Give two reasons why people may not like having wind turbines near their homes. Well, the disadvantages of uh, wind turbines is that they can produce visual pollution. Some people may not like the sight of it. Or noise pollution. Whilst I believe they are quite quiet, they may produce a bit of sound. Other um, issues that may be made from them is that they can be dangerous to birds. And potentially, if you've got a wind turbine very close to you, it could affect or reduce your house value. So, whilst I've given you four, you only need two of them to get the two marks. Question 1.5 says, figure two shows the electricity generated by different energy resources in the UK. The total amount of electricity generated was the same in 2014 and 2015. And you've got figure two, which are these two pie charts for 14 and 15. There are changes in the amounts of different energy resources used between 2014 and 2015. Explain the environmental impacts of these changes. So what we can do is first of all, analyze these pie charts, draw out the key conclusions, and then we can then use them to explain the environmental impacts. 
So if we have a look carefully, going round, always start maybe at 12 o'clock on the pie chart, we can see initially that the amount of coal has gone down by 8%. So write a little note to yourself, coal is down 8%. Whereas nuclear has gone up by 2%. Gas has stayed exactly the same, but renewables have gone up by 6%. So now we've got these readings, we can think about what it means. So we, one, we've got four different marks we need to say. So I would suggest um, giving two reasons and then two explanations. So we can say coal has decreased by 8%. Okay. Now, if we think what we know about coal, well, coal is a very dirty resource. It would um, when it is burned, it release, releases a lot of carbon dioxide and also sulfur dioxide. So therefore, if we're producing less of that, we're going to have less carbon dioxide produced and less sulfur dioxide produced. Carbon dioxide produces global warming. Sulfur dioxide produces acid rain. So if we're not burning as much of that, we're reducing the impact of those two processes. So coal has decreased by 8%. So therefore, there'd be less CO2 released. So therefore, less global warming. And then you could have less sulfur dioxide, SO2, released, which means less acid rain. If we then go round and look at the other things, we can see that nuclear has gone up. So we could say more nuclear. Now, what that means is therefore we're making more um, uh, energy from nuclear, but nuclear does not produce any greenhouse gases. So there's more nuclear energy by 2%. And the advantage of this there would be less CO2 as nuclear does not produce CO2. And then finally, I would say thing about the renewables have increased, which again reduces the amount of CO2 being released. Okay, so the key things that I've done here, I've identified the key patterns between the pie charts, and then I've also explained what that will mean for the environment. So moving on to question number two then. Figure three shows a mobile phone being recharged by a portable power source. So we've got our battery, our external battery that can be used to charge up our battery in our phone. So I would be now thinking about already the sources of energy that we've got. You should know in a battery, you've got chemical energy, and then it's going to travel along the wire, potentially as electrical energy. And then it's going to again, go in the battery into the phone. So it's gonna be transferred back to chemical energy. And remember, we always talk about energies in terms of stores. So there's a chemical store in the portable charger and there's a chemical store in the mobile phone. So why does the battery in the phone need recharging? So the store of the chemical energy in the battery has reduced. Well, initially I'm thinking potentially that is the right answer to begin with, because obviously as you use your phone, the amount of um, energy within it is going to reduce. But let's just double check the other ones. The store of thermal energy in the battery has reduced. Well, it's not going to be that because that's about heat. The store of kinetic energy has reduced. Well, that's not right because that's about movement. And the store of gravitational energy. Well, that's not right because that's about gravity. So this is just assessing that we know that in a battery, it is chemical energy. Question 2.2. The power source provides a current of 1.86 amps at a potential difference of 3.90 volts. Calculate the power 
of the power source. And it's given us the equation, power equals potential difference times by current. And then we've got to choose the correct unit from the box below, okay? So for each written calculation, it's always best to make sure you write it out fully, okay? So power, what we're calculating is potential difference, which is 3.90 times by the current, which is 1.86. So they've given us the equation, we've substituted it in, we calculate our unit, which is 3.9 times 1.86. So that gives us uh, 7.254. Now the units of it, okay, is power. And we should know that power is measured in watts. So 7.254 and the unit is watts. Just going through these other units then. Watts is the, as we've just said, is the units of power. Joules is the units of energy and coulombs is the units of charge, okay? So you need to make sure you do know your units. Question 2.3, a student needs a new power source. Figure four shows the three different size power sources. You've got uh, a, small, a compact one, a large one and a high capacity one. Table one gives data about the different power sources. So you've got the number of charges getting from it. And then you've also got the mass in grams of each one. So you've got the compact, large and high capacity. Suggest why the student chose the large power source. So we've got to be looking for the advantages of this large power source. So if we have a look at it, well, the number of charges, okay, is five times bigger than the compact, okay? So simply, large power source um, has five times as many charges as the compact, okay? And actually, it's only half the amount of charges as the high capacity. So we've explained why the large one is potentially the best um, for number of charges. Um, and now we can relate it to the mass in grams. Okay, well, we can see that actually the large is only 100 grams, is double the mass of the compact, but it's significantly lighter than um, the high capacity. Okay, so. It is double the weight of the compact, but only a third of the weight of the large, okay? So therefore, we could say the large power, power source is still quite light for five charges. It is um, one third the mass of the high capacity. Okay, so what we've done here is explain using number of charges and mass why the large one is the best. Uh, question number three then, figure five shows a girl skateboarding on a semicircular ramp. We look at the image, it's told us the height of the ramp is then four meters, and the girl has a mass of 50 kilograms. Calculate the gravitational potential energy of the girl at the top of the ramp and use the equation, GPE, mass, gravitational field strength, and height. And it's told us the gravitational field strength is 9.8. So all we have to do is use the numbers that they've given us, and put it into the equation. So g gravitational potential energy equals mass, which is 50 kilograms. So we just insert it in there. Gravitational potential energy is 9.8. So that just slots in there. 
and we see from our diagram the height is four meters. So when they give you a question like this, the numbers will be somewhere within the question. So 50 times by 9.8 times by four gives us 1,960 joules of energy. Okay, and that would get you your, your two marks. One mark for substituting, one mark for getting to your final answer. The girl, question 3.2, the girl has a speed of seven meters per second at the bottom of the ramp. Calculate the kinetic energy of the girl at the bottom of the ramp. Use this equation, 0.5 times mass times speed squared. So kinetic energy is 0.5 times by the mass of the girl. Now again, we'd have to go back to a previous part of the question to find the mass, which is 50, times by the speed squared. Now the important part of this equation is that you only square the speed. So I normally do this separately before plugging it into the main equation. So seven times seven is 49. So it is 0.5, times by 50, times by 49, equals 1, 2, 2, 5 joules of energy. Again, one mark for substituting, one mark for getting to the final answer. So, question 3.3 then. Not all of the gravitational potential energy has been transferred to kinetic energy. What two statements explain why? Tick two boxes. So, I would go back to and just make sure I look at this diagram again. So when the girl is at the top, she's got gravitational potential energy. As she moves down, it's being transferred to kinetic energy. Now, if the question is asking why not all of the gravitational potential energy has been actually transferred to kinetic. So let's see what the options are. Some energy is wasted. Well, wasted energy, maybe through friction, that would have reduced it. So therefore it could be that answer, but let's just have a look at the other ones to be sure. The mass of the girl is too low. Well, the mass wouldn't affect necessarily any wasted energy, so it's not that. The ramp is not high enough, well, that wouldn't affect any wasted energy. The GPE of the girl is not zero. Now, if we look back at our little diagram, we can see that actually, even though she's on the ramp, She's not actually on the ground. So the girl would still have a little bit of gravitational potential energy because she's still off the ground a little bit. So therefore, I would be inclined to say that one. And then the speed of the girl is too great. Well, again, the speed isn't necessarily going to affect um, the, any energy that is wasted. So it's not that one, and I would go with the top one. Some energy is wasted. Question 3.4. Explain how lubricating the wheels of the skateboard can increase the speed of the girl. Use ideas about energy in your explanation. Okay, so we're on about lubricating. Now, if you're lubricating something, the whole idea of lubrication is therefore to reduce friction. So, Lubrication reduces friction. And this idea is used obviously in skateboards, it's used in air cars, anywhere you've got something spinning, normally you would add some lubrication to reduce friction. That means less energy is wasted as heat Okay, so for example, when you rub uh, your hands together, you generate heat energy. Now, if you're using a lubricant, that means it would not generate as much heat. So therefore, what that now means is that you've got more energy going into actually what you want it to be used for. And in this case, we're getting more energy converted to kinetic energy. So this means more energy is converted to useful kinetic energy. And there would be your three marks there. So identifying the, that it reduces friction, and therefore it means less energy is wasted, and therefore 
more energy is being converted to useful kinetic energy. Question number four then. Some ceiling lights in the home are connected to the mains by a two core cable. Figure six shows a ceiling light. You've got the ceiling and the light, and then you've got the insulation and the copper wire. Okay, so suggest why some ceiling lights do not have an earth wire. Okay, so we can see that in a two core cable, you have the live and neutral wires, but it's missing the third wire, which is the earth wire. Now an earth wire is only needed if the device has a metal outer casing, okay? That's because it's the metal casing that can conduct electricity. But if this light is plastic, well, that is an insulator already, so it doesn't matter if the live wire becomes loose and touches this plastic casing because it won't conduct. So you could say the casing is not made of metal. So therefore, there is no chance of an electric shock. Question 4.2. Write down the equation that links charge flow, current and time. OK, so if we go back to our symbols for each one, charge is Q, current is I, time is T. Now, I always say that this is the quit equation. So it's Q equals I times T. So now we've got that, we're going to make us use this equation. There is a current of 2.95 amps in one of the copper wires for 60 seconds. Calculate the charge flow through the wire. Use your equation from 4.2. So all we would then do is substitute it. Our current is 2.95 and it's on for 60 seconds. So what we can do, 2.95 times by 60 is 177 coulombs and the units has been given to us already. Then question 4.4, figure seven shows the current potential difference graph through a piece of copper wire. Draw another line on for a wire with a different resistance. Okay, so all this is saying is that it can be it hasn't told us if it's a higher or a lower resistance. It just needs to be a wire with a different resistance. Now, this is copper wire. So it might be we're using a uh, nichrome wire, but it would still follow the same pattern as this. It's just the gradient will be slightly different. So you could just draw a line going up, obviously use a ruler, going through ideally the origin, OK, and going up. Now, you could also draw it at a flatter angle because it hasn't said draw it at a higher or a lower resistance. And just by doing that, drawing a line with a positive gradient would then get you the two marks. So you could draw either of them. Moving on to question 4.5 then. It says some fuses have a thin piece of wire a thin piece of copper that melts if the current is too large. Draw the circuit symbol for a fuse for one mark. So a fuse is when you've just got a rectangle, looks like a resistor, but you've got a piece of wire going through the middle of it. So that would be your symbol for a fuse. Describe how the movement of the copper particles in the wire changes when the copper melts. OK, so when it's basically describing to describe what happens to the particles when they melt. OK, so when they are in a solid and they get more energy, the particles would vibrate. So that's what the particles in a solid do when they get energy in a fixed position. So the particles would vibrate in a fixed position. And then when they get enough energy to melt, 
They are then able to be free and to move around. So they can then move around when melted. So question 4.7 then. Old copper wires are melted when they are recycled. Calculate the energy needed to melt 500 kilograms of copper at its melting point. The specific latent heat of fusion of copper is 200 kilojoules per kilogram. So use the equation from the physics equation sheet. So you would go to your physics equation sheet and you should see that energy required is equal to mass times the specific latent heat of the object. Okay, now on this example, we've just got to double check for units because we've got the mass is in kilograms. So that is correct. So we've got 500 kilograms, but specific latent heat, if we look really co closely, has been given to us in kilojoules. So one kilojoule is equal to 1000 joules. And we've got 200 kilojoules. So 200 kilojoules would be equal to 200,000 joules. So what you would then have to do is substitute that number in joules into your equation. So 500 times by 200,000 times those together and you end up with 100 million. So you have 100 and then you have your six zeros going off the end and the units are given to you which is in joules. Okay, then moving on to question five. Radioactive nuclei can emit alpha, beta or gamma radiation. What type of radiation is the most penetrating? So before I even begin these questions, so I'm just seeing it's multiple choice about alpha, beta and gamma, I would then recall my knowledge and the classic experiment about what stops each piece of radiation. So you've got alpha particles, which is two protons and two neutrons. You've got beta radiation, which is a single electron. And you've got gamma radiation, which is a wave. And then you can think about what will stop each one. Now, if I have a piece of paper, because alpha is the biggest, it's stopped by a piece of paper, but the electrons and the gamma waves can go through it. The electrons, though, can be stopped by a sheet of aluminium. Okay, so they will come along and they'll get stuck by a, sh a sheet of aluminium. But again, the gamma rays can pass through. Gamma is only stopped by a really thick sheet of lead. OK, so I know which one is the most penetrating, well, it's the one that can get through the most materials, so it'll be gamma. What type of radiation is the most ionising on 5.2? Well, ionising is the tendency of a piece of radiation to be basically knock electrons out of an atom. And therefore, the biggest one, alpha, is the most ionising because quite simply it's the biggest. What type of radiation has the longest range in air? Well, it's basically the same question as 5.1. Which one is the most penetrating? Which one can travel the furthest? Again, it's gamma. When radioactive isotopes in the Earth's crust decay, they release energy. The decay causes the heating of rocks in the crust. Figure 8 shows the decay of uranium-238 two, uh, into thorium-234, and it's given us this equation here. So we can see that the mass number of uranium has gone down by 2, and you can see that the um, mass number 
has gone down by four. Okay, complete table two to show the number of neutrons and protons in the nuclei. So this is going back to a bit of chemistry that does also come up in the physics paper. So we remember the atomic number, that is our proton number, and the atomic mass number, okay, is the number of protons and neutrons added together. Okay, so if we look at uranium first, it's told us we've got 146 neutrons. We can double check that by just calculating the difference between it. But we need to know the number of protons. Well, we just look at our atomic number, which is 92. If we add these two together, it will come to 238. Then if we look at thorium, we know we've got 90 protons, so that's been given to us here. But we now need to work out the number of neutrons. So again, you could do 234 minus 90. Just always double check it on the calculator. You've got a calculator to so always use it. So that is 144. Okay. Then question 5.5. Geothermal power stations pump water through heated rocks. The temperature of the water increases from 20 degrees to its boiling point of 100. Calculate the change in thermal energy when the mass of water is heated is 150 kilograms. The specific heat capacity is 4,200 joules per kilogram per degree Celsius. So again, you would look at your physics equation sheet and you would find this equation. Basically, you're looking for the equation that has specific heat capacity in it. Energy is equal to mass times by specific heat capacity times by the temperature change. So the mass in this question is 150. The specific heat capacity is 4,200. And the temperature change, well, it started at 20 and it's gone up to 80. So therefore the temperature change is 80 degrees, okay? So it's, so it's gone up to 100, so therefore it's increased by 80. You can times those together, and that then gives you 50,400,000 joules of energy. Don't be surprised when you do, and you calculate the amount of energy, don't be surprised if you get a really big number, because one joule is a tiny, tiny, tiny amount of energy, Therefore, in order to actually do anything, you normally need quite a, a large number of joules anyway. So, moving on to question six then. Okay, figure nine shows two atoms of a model. You've got the plum pudding model and you've got the nuclear model. Write the labels on figure nine. Choose from the answers in the box. Okay, so we've got the early version of our um, atom okay which was made by jj thompson which is the plum pudding model you should know and then you've got the nuclear model this is the one that we believe today is our current theory of the atom so we need to label each part so this line going to a negative charge well you should know a negative charge is always an electron and then so we can cross that one off then if we're not sure about what this outer one is, we can have a look and do um, the other diagram. So the other dot, the centre of it, of an atom, is always called the nucleus. So you can cross that one off. And then you can see that this line here is pointing to a shell, which out of our words that we've got left is an orbit. So we've used those three words. So going back to this one over here, well, it's not a neutron because neutrons are negative, uh, neutral charge. There's no neutrons in the plum pudding model, so it's not that. And there are no protons in the plum pudding model because it was the basic early version of our um, uh, atom. So therefore, by default, the word is just describing the whole atom. Question 6.2. 
Explain why the total positive charge in every atom of an element is always the same. OK, so why is the total positive charge in every atom always the same? So it's basically saying, why does every atom of carbon, OK, always have six protons, uh, always have six positive charges? Why does every atom of nitrogen always have seven positive charges? It's because positive charge is provided by protons. That's your first point. And your second point is therefore every atom of an element has the same number of protons. Question 6.3. The results from the alpha particle scattering experiment led to the nuclear model. So this gold uh, particle scattering experiment was conducted by Rutherford. OK, and you should know that from the timeline of atomic theory development. Alpha particles were fired at a thin film of gold at a speed of 7% of the speed of light. Determine the speed of the alpha particles. So, if, and you've been told the speed of light is 300 million meters per second. So what we need to do is find 7% of this number. Now you can do this loads of ways, okay? But I always just do it. Well, I find 1% and then times it up. So if I've got 300 million, okay, is 100%. To find 1%, I'm just going to divide this number by 100. Now, when I do that, I'm effectively taking off two zeros. So 300, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6 uh, zeros. So it's 3 million. Now, I'm after 7%, so I can now do 3 million times by seven, okay, which gives me an overall value of 21 million meters per second, okay? You can do it anyway, however you find 7% or any percent, however your math teacher gets you to do it, that would get you the two marks. Figure, um, a question 6.4, Figure 10 shows two atoms represented as solid spheres. You've got a hydrogen and a magnesium atom there. A hydrogen atom has a radius of 2.5 times 10 to the negative 11. Determine the, ra the radius of the magnesium atom. Okay, okay so question 6.3. The results from the alpha particle scattering experiment, and you should remember the this experiment where he shot gold, uh, sorry, alpha particles at gold was conducted by Rutherford, led to the nuclear model that we believe today. Alpha particles were fired at a thin, a thin film of gold at a speed of 7% of the speed of light. Determine the speed of the alpha particles. And it's told you the speed of light is 300 million meters per second. So what this is effectively doing is saying you need to find 7% of this number. So if 300 million is equal to 100%, we need to find 7. So I always do it. You find 1% and then times it up by to how many you need. So to find 1%, you can just take off two zeros. And that gives you 3 million. So if 1% is 3 million, I then need 7%, so I could times it by 7, which gives 21 million. Okay, so my answer is 21 million. Now, there are loads of different ways of doing it. You do it however your math teacher or science teachers say, but 
as long as you get to the final answer. Question 6.4. Figure 10 shows two atoms represented as solid spheres. A hydrogen atom has a radius of 2.5 times 10 to the 11. Determine the radius of the magnesium atom. Use the measurements from figure 10. So what you would have to do in the exam paper here, because it's that's all it's told you to use is figure 10. Now you would have to measure the sizes of these different atoms and figure out how much bigger a magnesium atom is compared to a hydrogen. And if you actually do this on the paper, you can see that the magnesium is six times bigger than hydrogen. So therefore, you've been told the radius of a hydrogen atom, which is 2.5 times 10 to the negative 11. So if this is the radius of the hydrogen and magnesium is six times bigger, all you can do, or what you can do, is just times that by six. And that then gives you the radius of the magnesium atom, which is 1.5 times 10 to the negative 10. So this is obviously just making sure you are comfortable using your calculator with standard form. Question seven then. A student wanted to determine the density of an irregular shaped object shown in figure 11. Plan an experiment that would allow the student to determine the density of the object. So this is the required practical for density. And you should be thinking back um, how you would do this. So you would need two key things. You would need a scale, okay, to measure the mass of the object. And then because it's an irregular shaped object, you would potentially need a Eureka can or a displacement can, which is where you can um, have a beaker or it's like a measuring cylinder you fill it up with water up to the spout you drop the object in and then it will displace the volume of that object into a beaker you could then transfer this amount of water into a measuring cylinder okay and therefore you can then read off exactly how much water has been displaced and that would give you the volume of that object okay so again the equation you need for density and it might be worth just jotting this down then is density is mass over volume so before i've dived into this six mark question i've just done a little memory brain dump of everything i know about this practical so now i've done this I can now start putting it into a logically sequenced answer. You need to make sure your answer is logically sequenced if you're going to get to the higher grade boundary. So first bullet point, what I would do is quite simply measure the mass of the object on the scale. Number two. I would then get a Eureka or a displacement can and fill it with water and place a beaker underneath. You would then put the object into the can the water would be displaced, which is equal to the volume of the object. Into the beaker. Then once you've got that volume of water, you put it into a measuring cylinder to record the exact volume of water. What 
what you can then do is put these values into the equation density is mass over volume and then that has allowed you um, to put loads of detail loads of pieces of equipment into this answer and you've sequenced it in a logical way for another person to follow 7.2 then a student did a similar experiment. He determined the density of five common plastic materials. So you've got the plastic materials going down the left hand side and the density. Figure 12 shows the results plotted in a bar chart. OK, complete figure 12. You should write the correct scale on the y axis and draw the bars for polyester, polystyrene and PVC. So we've got four marks here. So the first thing we need to do is figure out the scale for our y-axis here. And they've already put two bars on it. So I know acrylic is 1,200. So this bar here, this line must be 1,200. And nylon must be 1,000. Now I can see that there are four squares difference between these two bars and it's gone up by 200. So therefore, that each square, each little square, is therefore equal to 50, okay? So what I can then do, if I know that, I can put on the kind of key scale, so every five squares is gonna be 250. So 250, 500, 750, 1,000, 1,250, uh, 1,500, 1,750. What I can then do is plot the points on for the other ones. So polyester is 1380. So I would go to uh, just below 1,400, which would be just about there. Okay, and then I could draw, obviously you guys would use a ruler, that polyester bar one there. Polystyrene is 1,040, so it's just above the 1,000 line. Again, you guys use a ruler. And then PVC, 1,100, so that would be two squares above the 1,000 mark. Draw the line on, and you would get um, two marks for getting the scale correctly, and then two marks of accurately plotting these, these bars. Question 7.3 then. The student is given different uh, plastic material. The, stu stu the student determined the density of the material three times. Figure four, uh, sorry, table four, shows the results. So you've got the density three different times. Determine the uncertainty in the pupil's results. Now, the uncertainty is the difference between your highest and lowest value. Divided by two. OK, so my highest um, value is 1120. My lowest value is 960. And then whatever that is, I would divide it by two. OK, so if I actually now do that calculation fully, 1120 minus 960 is 160. Divide 160 by two gives me 80. So what effectively the uncertainty is saying is that it is either plus or minus um, 80 from our middle number. That would be the uncertainty in our results. Okay, so that's the end of the paper then. I hope it was useful. Remember, if there's any specific topics you struggle with, I've attached the revision videos in the description of this video. Okay, thank you.